Section 8 of History of the United States, Part 2, by Charles and Mary Beard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to learn how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, June 2007. A History of the United States, Part 2, Section 8. Peace at Last and Summary of the American Revolution. Peace at Last. British Opposition to the War. In measuring the forces that led to the final discomfiture of King George and Lord North, it is necessary to remember that from the beginning to the end the British ministry at home faced a powerful, informed, and relentless opposition. There were vigorous protests, first against the obnoxious acts which precipitated the unhappy quarrel, then against the way in which the war was waged, and finally against the feudal struggle to retain a hold upon the American dominions. Among the members of Parliament who thundered against the government were the first statesmen and orators of the land. William Pitt, Earl of Chatham, though he deplored the idea of American independence, denounced the government as the aggressor and rejoiced in American resistance. Edmund Burke leveled his heavy batteries against every measure of coercion, and at last strove for a peace which, while giving independence to America, would work for reconciliation rather than estrangement. Charles James Fox gave the colonies his generous sympathy and warmly championed their rights. Outside of the circle of statesmen, there were stout friends of the American cause like David Hume, the philosopher and historian, and Catherine Macaulay an author of wide fame and a Republican bold enough to encourage Washington in seeing it through. Against this powerful opposition, the government enlisted a whole army of scribes and journalists to pour out criticism on the Americans and their friends. Dr. Samuel Johnson, whom it employed in this business, was so savage that even the ministers had to tone down his pamphlets before printing them. Far more weighty was Edward Gibbon who was in time to win fame as the historian of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. He had at first opposed the government, but, on being given a lucrative post, he used his sharp pen in its support, causing his friends to ridicule him in these lines. King George in a fright lest Gibbon should write the story of England's disgrace, though no way so sure his pen to secure as to give the historian a place. Lord North Yields as time wore on, events bore heavily on the side of the opponents of the government's measures. They had predicted that conquest was impossible, and they had urged the advantages of a peace which would in some measure restore the affections of the Americans. Every day's news confirmed their predictions and lent support to their arguments. Moreover, the war which sprang out of an effort to relieve English burdens made those burdens heavier than ever. Military expenses were daily increasing. Trade with the colonies, the greatest single outlet for British goods and capitals, was paralyzed. The heavy debts due British merchants in America were not only unpaid, but postponed into an indefinite future. Ireland was on the verge of revolution. The French had a dangerous fleet on the high seas. In vain did the king assert in December 1781 that no difficulties would ever make him consent to a peace that meant American independence. Parliament knew better and on February 27, 1782, in the House of Commons was carried an address to the throne against continuing the war. Burke, Fox, the younger Pitt, Barre, and other friends in the colonies voted in the affirmative. Lord North gave notice then that his ministry was at an end. The king moaned, Necessity made me yield. In April 1782, Franklin received word from the English government that it was prepared to enter into negotiations leading to a settlement. This was embarrassing. In the Treaty of Alliance with France, the United States had promised that peace should be a joint affair agreed to by both nations in open conference. Finding France, however, opposed to some of their claims respecting boundaries and fisheries, the American commissioners conferred with the British agents at Paris without consulting the French minister. They actually signed a preliminary peace trap before they informed him of their operations. When Vergennes reproached him, Franklin replied that they, quote, had been guilty of neglecting by séance, good manners, but hoped that the great work would not be ruined by a single indiscretion, end quote. The Terms of Peace, 1783 
The general settlement of Paris in 1783 was a triumph for America. England recognized the independence of the United States, naming each state specifically, and agreed to boundaries extending from the Atlantic to the Mississippi and from the Great Lakes to the Floridas. England held Canada, Newfoundland, and the West Indies intact, made gains in India, and maintained her supremacy on the seas. Spain won Florida and Menorca, but not the coveted Gibraltar. France gained nothing important save the satisfaction of seeing England humbled and the colonies independent. The generous terms secured by the American Commission of Paris called forth surprise and gratitude in the United States and smoothed the way for renewal of commercial relations with the mother country. At the same time, they gave genuine anxiety to European diplomats. Quote, this federal republic is born a pygmy, end quote, wrote the Spanish ambassador to his royal master. Quote, a day will come when it will be a giant, even a colossus formidable to these countries. Liberty of conscience and a facility for establishing a new population on immense lands, as well as the advantages of the new government, will draw thither farmers and artisans from all the nations. In a few years we shall watch with grief the tyrannical existence of the same Colossus. End quote. Summary of the Revolutionary Period The independence of the American colonies was foreseen by many European statesmen as they watched the growth of their population, wealth, and power but no one could fix the hour of the great event. Until 1763, the American colonists lived fairly happily under British dominion. There were collisions from time to time, of course. Royal governors clashed with stiff-necked colonial legislatures. There were protests against the exercise of the king's veto power in specific cases. Nevertheless, on the whole, the relations between America and the mother country were more amicable in 1763 than at any period under the Stuart regime, which closed in 1688. The crash, when it came, was not deliberately willed by anyone. It was the product of a number of forces that happened to converge about 1763. Three years before, there had come to the throne George III, a young, proud, inexperienced, and stubborn king. For nearly fifty years his predecessors, Germans as they were in language and interest, had allowed things to drift in England and America. George III decided that he would be king, in fact, as well as in name. About the same time, England brought to a close the long and costly French and Indian War, and was staggering under a heavy burden of debt and taxes. The war had been fought partly in defense of the American colonies, and nothing seemed more reasonable to English statesmen than the idea that the colonies should bear part of the cost of their own defense. At this juncture there came into prominence in royal councils two men bent on taxing America and controlling their trade, Greenville and Townsend. The king was willing, the English taxpayers were thankful for any promise of release, and statesmen were found to undertake the experiment. England therefore set out upon a new course. She imposed taxes upon the colonists, regulated their trade, and set royal officers upon them to enforce the law. This action evoked protest from the colonists. They held a Stamp Act Congress to declare their rights and petition for a redress of grievances. Some of the more restless spirits rioted in the streets, sacked the houses of the king's officers, and tore up the stamped paper. Frightened by the uprising, the English government drew back and repealed the Stamp Act. Then it veered again and renewed its policies of interference. Interference again called forth American protests. Protests aroused sharper retaliation. More British regulars were sent in to keep order. More irritating laws were passed by Parliament. Rioting again appeared. Tea was dumped in the harbor of Boston and seized in the harbor of Charleston. The British answer was more force. The response of the colonists was a Continental Congress for defense. An unexpected and unintended clash of arms at Lexington and Concord in the spring of 1775 brought forth the King from England a proclamation. Quote, the Americans are rebels. End quote. The die was cast. The American Revolution had begun. Washington was made commander-in-chief. Armies were raised. Money was borrowed. A huge volume of paper currency was issued. And foreign aid was summoned. Franklin plied his diplomatic arts at Paris until in 1778 he induced France to throw her sword into the balance. Three years later, Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown. In 1783, by the formal treaty of peace, George III acknowledged the independence of the United States. The new nation, 
endowed with an imperial domain stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River, began its career among the sovereign powers of the earth. In the sphere of civil government, the results of the revolution were equally remarkable. Royal officers and royal authorities were driven from the former dominions. All power was declared to be in the people. All the colonies became states, each with its own constitution or plan of government. The thirteen states were united in common bonds under the Articles of Confederation. A republic on a large scale was instituted. Thus there was begun an adventure in popular government such as the world had never seen. Could it succeed? Or was it destined to break down and be supplanted by a monarchy? The fate of whole continents hung upon the answer. References J. Fisk, The American Revolution, two volumes. H. Lodge, Life of Washington, two volumes. W. Sumner, The Financier and the Finances of the American Revolution. O. Trevelyan, The American Revolution, four volumes. A Sympathetic Account by an English Historian. M. C. Tyler, Literary History of the American Revolution, two volumes. C. H. Van Tyne, The American Revolution, Perens, American Nation Series, and Perens, and The Loyalists in the American Revolution. Questions. What was the non-importation agreement? By what body was it adopted? Why was it revolutionary in character? 2. Contrast the work of the First and Second Continental Congresses. 3. Why did efforts at conciliation fail? 4. Trace the growth of the American independence from opinion to the sphere of action. 5. Why is the Declaration of Independence an immortal document? 6. What was the effect of the revolution on colonial governments, on national union? 7. Describe the contest between, quote, patriots and, quote, Tories. 8. What topics are considered under, quote, military affairs? Discuss each in detail. 9. Contrast the American forces with the British forces and show how the war was won. 10. Compare the work of women in the Revolutionary War with their labors in the World War, 1917 to 18. 11. How was the revolution financed? 12. Why is diplomacy important in war? Describe the diplomatic triumph of the revolution. 13. What was the nature of the opposition in England to the war? 14. Give the events connected with the peace settlement in terms of peace. Research Topics The Spirit of America, Woodrow Wilson, History of the American People, Volume 2, pages 98 to 126. American Rights Draw up a table showing all the principles laid down by American leaders in 1. The Resolves of the First Continental Congress, MacDonald, Documentary Source Book, page 162 to 166, and 2. Declaration of Causes and the Necessity of Taking Up Arms, MacDonald, page 176 to 183, and 3. The Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence, Fisk, The American Revolution, volume 1, page 147 to 197, Elson, History of the United States, pages 250 to 254. Diplomacy in the French Alliance, Hart, American History Told by Contemporaries, Volume 2, pages 574 to 590, Fisk, Volume 2, pages 1 to 24, Calendar, Economic History of the United States, page 159 to 168, Elson, pages 275 to 280. Biographical Studies, Washington, Franklin, Samuel Adams, Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, emphasizing the peculiar services of each. The Tories, Hart, Contemporaries, Volume 2, pages 470 to 480. Valley Forge, Fisk, Volume 2, pages 25 to 49. The Battles of the Revolution, Elson, pages 235 to 317. An English View of the Revolution, Green's Short History of England, Chapter 10, Section 2. And finally, English Opinion and the Revolution, Trevelyan, The American Revolution, Volume 3, or Part 2, Volume 2, Chapters 24 through 27. End Section 8, History of the United States, Part 2, and History of the United States, Part 2, by Charles A. and Mary Beard.